Chapter 18, General Pharmacology. We're going to first cover the, EM, the medications that EMTs can administer. Then we cover the pharmacodynamics and EM, uh, medications that others may take that are outside of our scope to deliver to them. So things we carry on the ambulance, aspirin, oral glucose, oxygen, activated charcoal, and naloxone, otherwise called Narcan. Aspirin, let's talk about it first. It is given to anybody that is suspected of having chest pain that is caused by myocardial infarction. It is a uh, drug that will actually reduce the clotting factors in the, the blood and help solve the problem that's causing the myocardial infarction. Next one we cover, oral glucose. It is basically just sugar that we give to our patients, uh, patients that have some type of diabetic emergency. We give them the oral glucose. It brings their blood sugar back up to a level that makes it better for them to have metal, uh, normal mental status. Oxygen, another drug we carry on the ambulance. Yes, it is a drug. You have to have medical direction or standing orders to give oxygen. We pretty much uh, function all on standing orders on oxygen, so any patient that is uh, it is under, under our care we can give oxygen to. Activated charcoal comes with many different names. It is charcoal that's been ground up and pulverized into a liquid form so that we can give it to our patients. It absorbs poisons in the body and helps uh, keep the body from absorbing those poisons into the bloodstream. Naloxone or Narcan it is a drug used for narcotic overdoses. It binds with the cell in the receptors for the narcotics, the opioid receptors. So when a person has heroin or morphine or uh, fentanyl in their system, this blocks the door that gives the morphine the access to that cell. If a person has not had narcotics, it has no effect. Some of the side effects of this one, though, is severe, dry, uh, severe vomiting after administration and also a lot of irritability if they wake up and find out you just killed their buzz. So it's a one that we use a lot of caution on. As an EMT, you can assist with medications. If the patient's prescribed medication that falls into our list, you can help them take the medication. Maybe it's uh, they're not sure how to take it, or they're nervous, or they're not at the point where they can actually do it themselves. Three drugs that we are authorized to provide assistance to our patients if they've been prescribed them are meter dose inhalers, nitroglycerin, and epinephrine. So let's talk about the bronco dilator or the meter dose inhaler. Typically it's albuterol. Uh, the patient has been prescribed this by their doctor for asthmatic attacks. If they're unsure how to take it, they're not sure uh, the dose, the route, everything you can think of, we're there to assist them. Meter dose inhalers or bronchial dilator inhalers are used uh, mainly for patients with asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, some type of long-term lung disease. These are different, uh, usually albuterol, but they also have some that are steroids. So in either any direction we go with these, they enlarge the uh, breathing tubes so they can breathe better. A couple of the side effects you're going to see if the patient's actually taking the meds like as directed is they will have an increased heart rate and they may uh, be a little jittery or uh, like they've just had a whole pot of coffee in 10 minutes. Another drug we have access to that uh, if the patient has it, we can give it to them is nitroglycerin. It's mainly used for chest pain, so you'll see it prescribed uh, for patients. Uh, what we have here on the screen is the liquid. It's a spray that goes underneath the tongue. It is 400 micrograms per spray. If you have the tablets, they're carried in a little dark colored bottle that gives them more protection from the sunlight. Those are 0.4 milligrams. So you have to know the difference. Uh, the liquid is 400 micrograms. 
the tablets are 0.4 milligrams, so kind of pay attention to that when we're talking about dosages here. It's taken by patients with a history of heart uh, chest pain because of cardiac disease. What it does is dilate blood vessels. It's a vasodilator. Because it dilates every blood vessel in the body, you have a little uh, contraindications here. If they have low blood pressure, anything below 100 or 90, depending on your protocols, you do not give it because it will drop their pressure even more. You do not give it with any other uh, vasodilators such as erectile dysfunction drugs like Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, any of those. You want to make sure that they are not taking those medications before we give this. And the side effect is exactly what we expect. If you dilate all the blood vessels, the blood pressure is going to drop. So about five minutes after giving this, you want to retest the blood pressure to make sure you're maintaining a good blood pressure. If not, you stop giving it. Auto injectors. Uh, epinephrine auto injectors. Epinephrine is a drug that we use for allergic reactions, severe allergic reactions called anaphylaxis. They come in many different formats here. We have the ones up on the screen that show you the different kinds. Uh, in Colorado, EMTs with IV certification can also draw up the epinephrine into a, a syringe and inject the patient directly without having it prescribed in an EpiPen format. So like we said, uh, severe allergic reactions, it's a vasoconstrictor. So it relaxes the smooth muscles in the airway and constricts the blood vessels around the body. So we increase your blood pressure by bringing everything back to a normal size. Side effect, very serious side effect is a increased heart rate and blood pressure. We want to make sure that uh, the patient needs it before we give it. And if they give it to themselves accidentally or without uh, having the anaphylactic reaction, it will cause that heart rate and blood pressure to shoot up a little bit there. We do have some areas that we have force protection medications. These are uh, classified as uh, nerve agent antidotes. Uh, Tupam is a brand name that you might see out there. They're auto epinephrine and, uh, or excuse me, atropine is the main ingredient in these. Our local system, we have them stored at a separate site that's secured. Uh, they do not carry them in the ambulance. Some of the uh, bigger cities, they may carry them in the ambulance, but we made some decisions here at the local that uh, uh, they would be stored in one central location and distributed if needed. General information we need to be aware of about all medications. We need to understand the names, whether it's the generic name, the chemical name, the trade name. People call things differently. So if the patient says they take acetaminophen, they may also be talking about uh, Tylenol. The acetaminophen is the generic name. Tylenol is the brand name or the trade name. When you're look, trying to figure out if a patient needs a drug, we have some major things we're going to look at. The indications. Why do they need? Why, why would you give the patient this drug? A patient is having chest pain. That's an indication for nitroglycerin. Contraindication, why wouldn't you give it to them if they have a blood pressure below 90 or they have had Cialis, Viagra, or other vasodilating drug? That's a contraindication. Or they're allergic to it. Side effects, what could happen as a, a mild effect? We know they're going to drop their blood pressure. They're going to have vasodilation throughout the rest of the body. That's a side effect of nitroglycerin. Untoward effect would be a severe drop of, drop of the low blood pressure or the severe headache they get. So we've got indications, contraindications, side effects, and untoward effects. Forms of medications. Things we, the way we get the medications. Compressed powders or tablets. That's uh, the aspirin. Liquids. That would be the uh, epinephrine or albuterol. Gels would be your paste, the uh, 
glucose suspensions that is where we're going to find uh be, that's the classification for charcoal it's ground up charcoal and a nice tasty uh laxative that's really sweet so that's your suspension fine powders is your albuterol mist gases is oxygen and sublingual spray would be your uh nitroglycerin when you're giving medications, it can be serious, so you need to have a good know, knowledge of the medication, the indications, the contraindications, the side effects, dosage, how to pay, make sure your patient really needs it, and how to, wa how to watch them to make sure it's effective on the patient. Most recent case that's hit the news is about a two-year-old case in Aurora, Colorado, where the paramedics gave a patient 500 milligrams of a drug ketamine based on the observations of law enforcement. They, From the reports, it sounds like they did not do an assessment on their own. They relied on fire, the uh, law enforcement to say the patient needed the medication and they gave too much of it based on the patient's actual weight. So being careful, making sure you have all the information and you confirm everything you need to do before, during, and after you give a medication is the right thing to do. To give a medication, we have two different routes. Offline medication, you, the doctor says, here's the standing orders, here's our guidelines, here's our protocols. If you find a patient that has this, medic, or this d symptom, you can give the medication. The other option is the online medical direction where you have uh, contact with a physician, you talk to them, you explain what your patient's doing, you ask for medication permission, and they make a decision to help you out. When your doctor tells you to give the medication, say if they say go ahead and administer four 81 milligram tablets of aspirin by chewing, you want to repeat that back to them. Okay, doctor, I hear you say four 40, 81 milligram tablets of aspirin by chew, having the patient chew them. Confirm it. If the patient says, or excuse me, if the doctor says, I want you to administer four cups of milk to your patient, you would ask for clarification. Doctor, did you say four cups of milk? We do not carry milk on the ambulance. That's not one of the drugs we mentioned. So that's something to question. Don't be afraid to question and clarify because we don't want to make mistakes. We want to make sure everybody's on the same page. In our current system, most of our physicians are emergency physicians and that's their sole job. Some of your rural communities, they have doctors that work in the ER as a part-time job and they have met other practices outside so they may not understand the pre-hospital uh, limitations and get, ask you to do orders that you can't give. So that's when you go back and do the questioning to see if uh, they understand what you're asking, they're asking you to do. Every time we give a medication we're going to go through the five rights. Do I have the right patient? If I'm giving a drug that's been prescribed to the patient, is their name on the prescription? Should be on the bottle or somewhere that we can verify it. Does the patient show the right indications for this? If they're not having chest pain, you don't give them medications for chest pain. Is it the right time to administer the drug? Are they showing all the symptoms? Are they prepared for the medication? Have you informed them of all the, the that you're going to give the medication and the possible side effects? Verify you have the right medication. Don't just assume that you know what's in the box that you're handing to the patient or you're giving to the patient. We've had a history in EMS of using color coding on boxes for what medication we want to give the patient. And sometimes those manufacturers change the color of the box. Make sure you know the right dose. If it's a dose dependent on the patient's weight, do as much as you can to get the correct weight. Am I giving the medication to the in the right route? Some drugs go in 
Orally, where you chew them and swallow them, like aspirin. Some are sublingual, like nitroglycerin, that go under the tongue. Some are injection, like an EpiPen. You need to know the route you're administering the drug and make sure you're doing it correctly. So you've got the five rights we need to make sure we're doing with every patient. The routes of administration that we have available to us. Orally, we give the patient and tell them to swallow it. This is how we typically give act activated charcoal, oral glucose, or aspirin. With the aspirin, we're going to ask them to chew it so that it, di it breaks down quicker in the digestive system. Rectally is an option for giving medications. It is a paramedic level skill, but as an EMT, you can assist with this. Medi any medication that can be swallowed can be uh, administered rectally. Uh, it goes in and is quickly absorbed through the digestive tract. Sublingual or dissolved under the tongue, that's the nitroglycerin. Inhaled or breathed into the lungs, oxygen. Intranasal, that was that little Christmas tree we looked at for the uh, Narcan. You spray it into the nose, it absorbs through the mucosal membranes and gets into the bloodstream really quick. Intravenous or into the vein, this is a skill that EMTs with IV training can use. Intramuscular, this will be your epinephrine. You give that, it goes, sends out about an inch and a half needle into the muscle. Subcutaneous, goes right underneath the skin. If you've had your TB skin test, that's where they put it, is right underneath the skin. It take, It's a delayed response. It absorbs a little bit slower. Interosseous, or into the bone. This is another route that EMT basics with IV training can administer medications and fluids. Uh, as an EMT, you're trained to drill the needle into the bone and get provide that level of care to your patient. Another route is uh, endotracheal. Paramedics can give drugs into the uh, tracheal tube and have it absorb into the lung tissue. So that's some routes you might run into as an EMT, you might see these things. Let's talk about uh, pharmacodynamics. A study of effects of medications on the body. If you've ever watched TV, you've seen ads for drugs, and the they tell you everything the drug's going to do, how it's going to miraculously kill it, cure everything you've got, and then it tells you the list of mandatory side effects that they want to tell you what's going on. So we want to understand how the drug works in the body so we don't have those side effects and how we and so we can watch for the mild effects and stop before we have serious effects. Some some things about our patients change how uh, the drug works on them. Maybe they have kidney disease or liver disease and the body doesn't absorb things as quick as possible. Or it won't absorb the medication at all because of other medications they're taking. So we need to understand how the medications work together and against each other and how they work with the different conditions a patient may have. When you give a medication, you document who told you to give the medication or why you gave it, what route you gave it, how much you gave, and what the reaction to the, pa the medication the patient had. So document everything. Document if you make a mistake. If you try to hide a mistake, that's a lot worse than coming clean up front and saying, Doc, I gave the wrong med, but this is what I did to help fix it. I would definitely call medical control before you do anything to fix it to make sure we're on the right path. But fixing problems is much better than hiding problems. This one you might see on a patient that has some type of respiratory problem. It's a, uh, a daily use respiratory disease. Uh, inhaler it gives them a dose of uh, the medication they need to keep their airways clear a lot of our patients are on routine meds if you see if you understand the basic meds and understand what they might be taking them for it helps you under get a history of your patient a little bit quicker some of the herbs that the patients take all different options here this is the table in your book uh, Everybody thinks they have a new disease or a new uh, herbal supplement to cure the problems. 
So pay attention to what they tell you. Know the different ones out there. And then if you're not sure, ask the patient why they take it. They usually know. So let's talk about IV therapy. As an EMT basic, you cannot start IVs. You need to go to the IV training class, which we have here at UC Health. But you have to be in the Colorado EMT before you can get in because we have to have you cleared to do clinicals. But well, even before then, you can help with setting up IVs. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. An IV is a way to get fluids in, or medications into the body quickly. The first one, first basic, uh, the very basic option we have is a saline lock or a heparin lock. We put a catheter into the vein. We put a cap on it, and we put either saline to keep a clot from forming or heparin, which is an anti-clot medication. And that gives us a port to give medications anytime we need to. What you see a lot uh, on patients that are more critical are IV bags. They hang, have, a, have the same type of catheter put into the patient, and we typically put the... Uh, saline lock in and then hook this bag to that saline lock just so we have a, a way to change things out if we need to. So important things with the IV bag is make sure it's above the patient. If you put it below, the blood draws drains back into the bag. So we want to keep it above so that we have gravity feeding it into the body. You have the clear plastic tubing that connects everything from the catheter to the uh, bag. That clear plastic tubing, it's important things. The drip chamber, this is where we can measure how much fluid is going into the body. We have two different sizes we primarily use in EMS. One is, it's called a micro drip. So every drip is one sixtieth of a milliliter. So 60 drops makes one milliliter. The other one is one-tenth of a milliliter. So every 10 drops makes a milliliter. So it helps us, we count the number of drops so we can tell how much is going. To change the flow, we have a regulator that goes up and down on the side that we can adjust how much fluid is moving through. And then we also have ports on the side that if we need to give medication, we don't have to take it out of your patient, you just add it to the, the, med, the IV fluid. It shows the EMT checking the bag to make sure it's within the expiration date, and it's clear. It uh, has to be all of the medications we give, or all the IV fluids we use pre-hospital are clear, so you should be able to see through them, and they need to be within the expiration date. This is a spike that goes into the bottom of the bag. What's under the, the thumb is the drip chamber. That's where it drips in. You can see the flow control that's in the package. It's got the little roller uh, that goes up and down, and you move that to change how much flow is going through. This is putting the spike in the bag. Typically, we do it upside down, so if it leaks, you don't get it covered in fluid, but that's okay. A little bit better picture of the drip chamber. You can see how big that... Uh, the drip part of it is underneath the white top. That is a, t a 10 milli or 10 drop set. And then you'll see the drops dripping into the chamber here. And then it goes through the tube and this is your adjustment port. You can roll it up to make it go faster, roll it down to make it go slower. This is uh, adjusting the flow. To maintain the IV, this is where EMTs will save your paramedics. If there, ha if the, f it's you don't see a drip in the chamber, make sure they know that the IV is not flowing. And here's the things you want to check: Did you forget to turn it back on? Did you close a clamp on the tubing? There's some clamps throughout the tubing. Did somebody kink the tube? Did you park the ambulance cot on the tubing? Maybe it's caught underneath the patient and uh, uh, twisted around. Did you take the constricting band off used to start the IV? Did you put a tourniquet on that arm? Or are you taking a blood pressure on that arm? 
Are you impeding the flow of blood somehow? Then ever so often you want to look at the site to make sure that they're not bleeding anywhere or that they're not having any swelling or redness or in, um, the skin's getting warm around the injection site. That's a sign of infection or infiltration. All bad things that we need to address uh, with the IV certified person. So as always, if you have questions, feel free to bring them to class and let's chat. Thanks.